welcome to Fun Pilot Podcast, where we are unpacking opinions and changing destinations. I am your host, Shirley Altador, where each week we will chat about how to rise strong out of all types of obstacles that come with relationships. Through personal life experiences and discussions ranging from infidelity, trust, forgiveness, sex, heartbreak, self-love, and so much more. I am passionate and obsessed to provide guidance to every woman to create a better life. Let's dive in, pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. With me, your virtual girlfriend. Welcome back to another episode of Fun Pilot Podcast. And today for story time, we do have a special guest with us. We have Kim, who is passionate about helping women found find their bold voices. A born entrepreneur with 25 years of 25 years as a leader in corporate America. Half the time I can't even read. But Kim, I'm going to pass you the mic so you can <laughs> add on to my story and let the listeners know who you are, what you do before you start talking about your story. Uh, first of all, Shirley, thank you for having me here uh, today. It's just uh, it's a great pleasure and it's an honor. And um Again, my name is Kim Boudreaux Smith, and yes, I in my before life I was in corporate. Now in today's life, as a first woman of pioneering an internet radio station, which I no longer have, I am a business and speaking coach for women. I help women really claim and own their bold voice and own any room that they walk into unapologetically, overcoming imposter syndrome and leaving other people's opinions behind. That's what we do. This is wonderful. I love that because as women, we are taught to be meek. Don't say too much because you'll be considered a bitch. Don't use your voice. Don't express mm-hmm. yourself. So I love that. Teaching women how to be bold, fierce, and in charge and still yeah. be respected. So again, As we continue now, I'm going to pass you the mic again, and you are going to share with us your story and tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you to where you are right now? Uh, Well, oh gosh, I love that how you just jump in. So I'm just going to jump in back with you. I fell asleep at a major intersection right here by my home uh, about 12, 12 years ago in the middle of the day. And it wasn't because I was extraordinary tired or stressed out Um, it was noon it was a beautiful August sunny day which is big time here in Michigan because for those that are listening in you know we have snow and things like that so I fell asleep at a major intersection and here I didn't even know I was gonna fall I it just happened but my head fell forward so I pulled it back and did it again fell forward pulled it back And literally, surely the first thing that happened in that minute, that moment was not like, oh my God, did my foot come off the brake? And am I in the intersection? Did I hurt someone? Did I hurt myself? No, it was like, who the hell saw me? Oh my, who who saw me? And then it was, let's check in. I'm safe. I didn't roll out in the intersection. I didn't hurt anybody. And that was the biggest wake up mile drive home. I was on my way home that day mm-hmm. um, ever in my entire life that was a I was and don't get me wrong I mean I had a, I have a beautiful home beautiful life very successful career in corporate successful multiple um, entrepreneurial businesses and I literally fell asleep because I would wake up every morning and lay there in bed at 5 a.m. I'm an early bird and I would go through the day check what time check what time? Ch- Great. I'm done at one o'clock this afternoon so I can be back home and in bed, in bed by two o'clock in the afternoon. And I would do just that fully clothed. I would do just that. Fully clothed. So when you woke yes. up at five, first thing you went mm-hmm. is you looked at your to-do list on your phone or your computer, wherever you kept it, and you were checking off everything that needed to be done in the corporate job. Uh, no, this is my, uh, this is, this is past, this is post, uh, excuse me, this is way past corporate. And I wouldn't even get out of bed. I would lay in bed and mentally go through the checklist. I was talking myself back asleep before I was, before my feet even hit the ground in the morning. Why is that? 
I was living a life of um, lack of gratitude, lack of passion, lack mm -hmm. of clarity, ungrateful. I had a very, my first entrepreneurial uh, business is, um, it's a fitness business mm -hmm. and it's still alive a little bit, but mm -hmm. it was a huge fitness business. And in this area, I live in a county called Oakland County and mm -hmm. I was serving the people in their homes. I would drive to their homes in Oakland County, people's homes you just don't walk up and knock on the door. You're referred in. These are very upper echelon people, mm -hmm. famous names. So you just don't show up. So I was referred in and I, and one thing led to another. I, mean, I had a great um, sprint with a uh, developing an eight week introduction course for women. Mm -hmm. and, and I marketed it through community education. I, it was such a success that there's an, I'm now I'm going to really date myself. There's an eight track video tape out there of an exercise that I developed. And I had to bring on um, seven independent contractors to help me run this community. I mean, it blew up it, I, in a great way. It blew up. But when things started coming down and selling out, settling out, I would use, surely I would use the word, I'm bored. I'm bored. Bored. And I, to this day, got to be careful when I start getting those bored feelings. I got to be careful because it's more than just a boredom. It's far deeper than that. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying I'm bored. And I would drive home from clients home at that time. And I was half online and still in person and mm -hmm. launching the online business and stuff. I'm bored. And so I was like in gratitude. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I was very unappreciative of what I had. I was so busy looking at what I didn't have, what oh gosh, look at Shirley, she's got all of this. And going into the comparison mode, mm -hmm. hence I fell asleep at that major intersection, which again, it's only like a mile right over here from my house, it's not far. So e even now, because you're still living in that house that you were driving to when you, were fe when you fell asleep. So after you fell asleep, what did you do? You just kind of woke up, look around, okay, everything's safe, everything's okay. You just went back home, then what happened? So in Michigan, we have these these Michigan turns on these streets. So I had to go through the light. I had to do a Michigan turn in order to head west towards my home, mm -hmm. face the light again. And so here's what I did. I cranked the air conditioning. I rolled all the windows down. I turned full steam ahead of rock and roll music really loud. And I white knuckled gripped that steering wheel and went, woo, I'm awake and went, wow, something is wrong. I, so I drove home safely. I was about a mile away. I drove home safely. And I remember that day pulling up in my driveway, getting out of my cute little red car going, this car, how could you? You know, it was like the car's fault. It wasn't my fault, you know, and <laughs> I ran into my house and I, surely I stood here at my house holding my bag. And I have two dogs at the time, pet them and said, hello. I held my bag and I looked around and I, it was like I was waiting for someone to arrive and wave the magic wand to make it feel okay. Mm -hmm. And I, did, I didn't hear the, the music. I didn't hear, I, no one showed up and I went, I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm in huge trouble and I know I need to reach out to people. And I... I sat down. I mean, at that point, I just released and sat down and let go. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing led to another. I started reaching out to my, I, my, I have a huge community. I reached out to my trusted mm -hmm. resources in that community to help me. Gotcha. And what was the help that was given? What happened next? Because during this time, 12 years ago, this was the fitness business that you were running at the time, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. did you have other streams of and income? And it was, yes. So I had the fitness business because I was winding that down mm -hmm. and I was stepping into the online world mm -hmm. um, and I was get, getting involved in anthologies, pulling mm -hmm. women together, um, running project management for anthologies um, and, and going through uh, my coaching certifications. So I knew there was one person, one woman I had to reach out to, and I, I could not find her information. And a couple of days later, I was going into a yoga class, and it was just sparking up a conversation with this woman. And 
we started talking and she, I said, I'm a trainer. And she goes, oh, I teach yoga. And she goes, do you know so-and-so? And I'm like, yeah, I know so-and-so. And then I said, oh, but do you know Ellen Miller? And, you know, or, and she goes, yeah, I have her information out in the car. And that was the woman that I wanted to call. I couldn't find her information in my house. Mm-hmm. She goes, I'll get it for you after the class. And I said, double thumbs up, not a problem. And so I reached out. And the reason why I called in this person that's very influential in my life is Ellen um, has a uh, has a program. I'll use the word program, and it's far more than a program. Mm-hmm. It's where women can step into and they can journey and bring into the stuff that they need to heal. Mm-hmm. And it's a nine-month journey. And I called her and said, I need help. I need to step back in. This is what's going on. And she said, well, this is how it looks now. And I said, I don't care. Um, send me the information and let's get going. Because I, at that time I was 48 and a half and looking forward to turning 50. Mm-hmm. And I knew I wasn't going to make it to 50 if I didn't get my act together. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So you called Ellen now before we talk about Ellen. So how long had you had been doing the fitness and why did you leave the corporate world so our listeners could know? Because you did that for 25 years. So I'm assuming you did that for most of your 20s and your 30s. Mm-hmm. And then now from yes. corporate, you went into fitness. Yes. And how long were you doing fitness? I was doing, I was doing corporate as I was launching my fitness business. So I was moonlighting, so to speak, after COVID. Gotcha. I moon- to, until things got going again. Um, I, you know, I had a, I had a bad toxic experience in corporate mm-hmm. and um, came back into Michigan. And that current corporate job that I was working was very toxic. All men, I was the only woman at a table, Mm. um, didn't have female support back then, didn't even know what that looked like back then. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was launching the fitness business and my goal was to get that fitness business so darn busy uh, in the evenings and on the weekends that I could take and resign from corporate. And I did it. You know, it was not a smooth road there, especially that transition in the beginning, Mm because I I don't want to, I don't want anyone listening, thinking that. If you are wanting to leave your corporate job and go into entrepreneurship, that it's a piece of cake. It is not. There's a lot of bumpy roads and ups and downs and joys and tears and and no regrets from this person here on your show. But um, I did it. I stepped away. And um, that first year in fitness, I was not even thinking that summertime in Michigan Clients don't want to stay inside and work out because they're doing golf leagues. They're doing tennis. They need babysitters because kids are home from school. So my first summer, I plummeted. And that's when I sat and said, okay, there's got to be something else I can be doing in the fitness business. Like I couldn't afford me to knock on my home door like I was doing for my clients. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be a whole other a whole other environment of women that I could touch on. And so I developed an introduction to strength training for women and marketed it through community education. Gotcha. That's how that all came about. Um, and that was really, that was seasonal, very successful, mm-hmm. but it upped the season that when the next summer came, I was like, okay, this is not as bad as that was that first summer. This is what I love to hear. The fact that you are honest with our listeners, you let them know that you didn't just immediately exit from the corporate job. Mm -hmm. You waited to make sure it was a smooth transition. And entrepreneurship, as you said, it's not easy. It is a bumpy road. There are certain days it's going to be smooth riding. Other days you are going to be bleeding, climbing that rock up and trying to get to where you're getting and then you're going to fall right back down. So it's not an easy transition from corporate corporate to entrepreneurship, and you do have to work hard. Now, I am a strong believer in multiple streams of income. So regardless, of course, what Mm -hmm. direction you want to go into, whether you want to leave your corporate job and start entrepreneurship or stay in the corporate job and still do entrepreneurship, either way, it's work. It's not just I'm going to sit back and relax and all this money's coming in. And, you know, I have this stream of income, that stream of income, and I'm getting income here because what do they say? Seven, you should have seven streams of income. 
Seven Mm -hmm. can be tough to achieve. I always tell women, at least if you have three, to me, that's phenomenal because sometimes the other four might be a little difficult for you to achieve, but go ahead. So now you've contacted Ellen, is that correct? Mm -hmm. For the nine month program. And let's fast forward into that from starting to finish. How did that go? That was one of the most amazing, amazing gifts that I gave myself. In fact, I loved it so much. I became one of the co-facilitators in the program, which I'm no longer in. I mean, Ellen has retired um, and it's a huge, huge commitment to be one of the co-facilitators. And it was... um, that was a huge jump, deep dive into myself. And I, I have a, an extremely supportive husband. He's like, go, go do what you got to do. You know, and of course, as he's staying behind watching TV or, you know, play <laughs> golf or football or whatever, not, but, you know, you know, go, go, you know, and do what you got to do. And it was, this is going to be a very um, biased statement and I own my bias, but I'm coming from the bottom of my heart. Every woman should experience something like this because it's other women supporting women mm-hmm. going through some whatever their pains are, the pains of you know healing, whether it's been from a divorce or losing a child or um, sexual abuse or whatever the case may be. And in my case, um, I was seeking for that peace within because I wasn't I was an anxiety insane anxiety mm-hmm. person mm-hmm. Um, and recovering control freak and I wanted the anxiety to go away which hence many years later anxiety does not completely go away I wanted to learn how to manage it mm-hmm. so it does not control me and make me sick mm-hmm. and um, so that was one of the pieces I was bringing to my nine month um, journey and also too at that time, knowing, uh, you know, several years down the road, I was going to have aging parents and to come to terms with the relationship that I have with my mother. My mom wasn't always the mom that when I'm younger, having that judgment, you should be, this is how this mother should be showing up. Well, you know, that's pretty tough. And my mom was doing the best that she could. And I'm glad I did that work because I lost my father a year ago. So to have to come to terms as opposed to as they are exiting and leaving with those regrets of they weren't the parents I thought that they should be, you know, or then I don't have the mother that I thought the mother should be, even though my mom is uh, still alive. So I brought a lot of that to the table and it was, that was the gift for me. Mm -hmm. That was me really stepping into that not just self-care, but that soulful caring, that Mm self-healing. That's great that she, so what exactly, so how did her program look? Nine months, was it once a week you met, once a month you met? Um, We meet, we would meet once a month and the once a month from th- for three hours once a month mm-hmm. and in between the once a month meetings you had a um what we called a circle sister she was your mentor and so there would be one or two maybe calls a month it depended upon what you needed mm-hmm. and then there were two retreats on the east side of michigan on lake huron i mean they and they were wonderful we would arrive on a Friday morning and depart after dinner on Sunday. Um, We did one in, when did we, we did one in the summer, you know, yeah, summertime, I think it was like June. No, no, I take that back. More like May. And then we did the other one in October. And the reason why May and October, seasonal number one, Mm -hmm. and um, spring and summer represents, um, feminine energy, the feminine, um, from the feminine grandmothers, the feminine energy, the fall winters are more grandfathers. Mm -hmm. So we were working with, um, different energies as well. It sounds a little, uh, woo woo, but I trust you. It is not woo woo. It was a beautiful work. No, I, I don't think it sounds woo woo because we don't do self care enough. I feel in a program like this is very bent. I, I shouldn't say, I know you said it's not, it was more than a program, but something like this that Ellen offered 
is good for someone to tap into. As, as women, we do so much, but we don't always take care of ourselves. We don't care to our needs. Mm -hmm. We're always overbooking ourselves between personal and work, but we never allow any time. I don't know anybody that blocks out time of their day and say, these two hours are for me to do whatever the hell I want to do. And I'm not going to communicate with anybody. No one does that. Who does that? You know, it's interesting you say that, Shirley, because I just put a video out on LinkedIn around that exact topic about having, you know, the white space in our calendars. And I'm a recovering, grind it, grit it, get it done kind of girl. And if there's a problem, I can get to the solution. And if there's a promotion, I, you, I'm going in, I'm going after it. And I am now learning how to schedule in that space mm -hmm. and to be able to be very spontaneous and unplanned and whether I'm going out into the family room and sitting down and reading a magazine or just sitting down and petting my dogs mm -hmm. without the estrogen guilt and the inner critic choking my body down. And you're right. We don't as women do that for ourselves. And even if it's just five minutes, mm -hmm. five minutes is better than no minutes. Exactly. Because it's that shame that's attached to it. And it's the world that we live in. Society has made us feel if you're not constantly moving or doing something, you're not being productive. So if you block yeah. out that time, even if it is five minutes, what the opposite of that is, now you're talking to yourself, well, I just wasted five minutes of my time when I could have made sure this was done, this was done, this was done, this was done. So now you're beating yourself up because of that personal care time you took as though there's so that's such a priority. And it's really not. There's nothing in this world that's really truly a priority. Number one, then self-care, making sure you're OK, because if I drop dead tomorrow. Guess what? Something's going to happen We're to that task. To anybody. Exactly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that. if Shirley's point. not here, that task will be accomplished. Exactly. Exactly. And the, what's most important, babies, children, you know, loved ones are going to not benefit from that happening. And that was part of my falling asleep mm -hmm. behind the wheel was a lot of that going on. Gotcha. So now... After the nine months, did you decide to leave the corporate job? Um, during that nine months, I was already um, out of corporate at that point. Um, I'm wait a minute, hold on, timeline. Yeah, I was already out of corporate. I was full-fledged into entrepreneurship. And that was the other thing that I was bringing into my nine months was, you know, being okay with myself and you know, mistakes and not everybody's going to say yes to me. And that pledges on confidence and worth. And it's like, I got my hands on my hips. I'm like, I'm looking at Shirley and she's doing great. And what is she, do? you know, that comparison that, that niches us down. It's like you were saying, you know, we play small, um, we weigh in, we think we need to be at a certain space in our lives and time because Shirley or Sue or someone down the street is doing different. And when we don't even know what's going on behind those closed doors, but we compare, you know, and we, we shrink down because society has told, told us to shrink down mm -hmm. big time because we cannot ruffle feathers. We cannot fluff our feathers because if we fluff our feathers, then we're going to look egotistical or we're going to look bitchy like you were saying or mm -hmm. you know whatever that may be when we have a voice that needs to be embraced and not allowing society tell us how to sit how to stand what mm -hmm. to wear how to say it mm -hmm. but to but to embrace it and say it and show up so i want to ask you a question and that's a good topic to um to continue on what you just said you know Within the first two years, a lot of times a business doesn't make it. Being an entrepreneurship is hard. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are thinking about the cash flow and they're not really truly taking consideration the work that goes involved 
to running a business because most people are employees. So they report to their nine to five, they do their time and they go home. Now, when you are the CEO running the business, it's a whole different look that you're getting. And they do say on average that within the first two years, you're either going to make it or you're not. But do you also feel with that whole comparison is number one, especially with women, because we're going to stay on focus on women. Of course, this is any, any sex, but with women, we are comparing ourselves so much to the next person. And I'll use myself as an example. We already know as podcasts, as a podcaster, there's two ways that you make money in this business. Rather, you're offering coaching services or classes or sponsorships. You know, it's not like YouTube and for every listen, you're getting a certain amount of coins. It doesn't work like that with podcasts. And a lot of podcasters fail because they're so worried about their download numbers. They get involved in something they're not passionate in and they get discouraged because it's all about the dollar amount. But when your focus is so much about the dollar amount and when you're not truly passionate about what you're doing, you are going to fail because you started your whole entrepreneurship business for the wrong reasons. Yeah. But I want to hear your take on why do, why do you feel as though as women, there's so much comparison, especially regardless what industry you're in? Well, I think it goes back to... you. Um, now I'm going to really take a spit and really date myself is, you know, it's like a neighborhood thing. You know, it's like, um, you know, the expression comparing yourself with the, with the Browns, the Joneses mm -hmm. and the Smiths, you know, I mean, and back when I was younger, of course there was no internet and anything like that. Kids, we were playing out in front and, you know, it's, I remember hearing my parents talk about, Oh, look at their house. And it's so beautiful from the outside. And I think that is that comparison that begins back then. But we girls, when we're young, we, you know, we've got girlfriends that we're watching and, Oh, I want that dress. And those go-go boots are really cool and they're just cool. And I think it starts, that comparison starts very young. But when we step into as an adult into the entrepreneurship, I agree, we will do things for the love of money. And I'm going to tell you, it will be the breaking point of any human being. Now, at the end of the day, I'm not saying we don't deserve money. We need money. When mm -hmm. you've got an electric bill to pay, when you've got mm -hmm. food to put on the table, I understand. I get that. Mm -hmm. um, and at one time, I had to feed three dogs and I was single, you know, going through a divorce, going, oh, my God, my clients are, at, at, you know, at that time, my fitness business, my clients, they leave. A lot of them leave for the wintertime. They have homes mm -hmm. in other areas. And I was panicked, panicked. Um now I'll say to you, I'm, I'm very privileged. I mean, I, my, I have a husband who has got a very good career mm -hmm. um, of 30, you know, almost 30 years. I have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. We don't all have that flexibility. So when we start launching businesses, first of all, not only is there that comparison, surely, but there's that shiny, flashy object syndrome that just seems to take place and that's where some of the make it or break it goes on because I hear some of these women I, a lot of the entrepreneurs I work with has they need to have two years under their belt and I'll tell you why first of all so they've got money coming in to, to a, a, an investment so I you know so they get a return on their investment hence me mm -hmm. um, they know who their ideal client is and they're pretty damn clear about that ideal client and their target audience and they're just not going everywhere but I've had conversations with women that are about two years in and they're like, yes, I made this huge investment my first year. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, but why? You don't need to be hiring that videographer that first year. Now, several years ago, could we get away launching a business without having a website right away? Yeah, but that's not the, that's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. 
find an awesome website designer who's going to meet you where you are and not charge you five thousand dollars out the gate maybe it's a one page website that you can send people to and and this is and this is a very serious and then just also to an example but i'm a big business coach of let's get you money let's get you clients if that is what your business is let's get sales coming in the door here and let's not take a look at how everyone else is running it because how everybody else is running it is not going to certainly has never worked for me i mean when i had my radio station we weren't doing a lot of funneling and marketing and all that it didn't it doesn't work for me i've tried it multiple times it doesn't work now mm -hmm. if you're a funneler go ahead i'm not saying anything wrong with that but it's what one person is doing is not going to work for the other and that's where we need to let go of that comparison and my journey as an entrepreneur is going to be very different mm -hmm. as Shirley's journey, whether in corporate, you know, working for an organization and whether her gig is, you know, straight on podcasting. But it always amazed me with my internet radio station. These women would do their, um, their first show. And the first thing they would say afterwards, what were my numbers? But, yes. What were my numbers? It's like, wait a minute. You've got a producer there. How about if we have a conversation of how did I do? How did I sound? I had all these sensations and nerves going on in my first show. What helped me here? How can, as I'm evolving, where, where, what can be my next steps? Let's not worry about the numbers. And yes, the numbers are important, but you've had one show underneath your belt. And hence, that's why I would see a lot of my clients you know, after a couple months of their radio shows, and this is not working. It's like, sure, you've only been here for 60 days. Of course it's not working because you want money and you want numbers. I agree 100%. When I started this podcast, I'll never forget it. One person said, be ready to put out 100 episodes before anybody even consider looking your way because that right there is going to tell people, well, she's fucking showing up. I'll showing up <laughs> and I'm like a yeah. hundred episodes. Okay. I'm ready for this journey then. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you know, and surely that's life. It's a journey. We are not sprinting down to the corner of my street here. And if you do want to sprint down the corner of my street, I'll power walk behind you. You go <laughs> ahead, but I'm not interested in the sprints. This is a journey. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes back to my nine month nine months is gestational. I was birthing something back then as a journey. I'm still birthing. I'm still journeying. I'm mm -hmm. not perfect. I am still, I still have a lot to unfold. One of it being, you know, that white space in my calendar and not flipping out over it, you know, to be okay with it. And that I'm okay because I don't have my calendar filled up, which I'm in, I'm in recovering, have a Microsoft Outlook color coded filled up Monday through Friday and would lose my mind by the end of the week, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> color coded, lose my mind. I want to talk about your, you said you're a control freak. How did that, like, when did you realize you were a control freak? Did the corporate world make you that? Or did you realize that when you were young? if I realized that young being raised by um, a mother that was very controlling um, mm. you know uh, not knowing what direction to go into I was grounded a lot because I spoke up I talked back even though I was a straight-a student things weren't good enough I don't think I recognized that when I was younger it was more as I was inching in to my adult years and probably I got through my third uh, 20s and 30s before I really recognized that my control freak, being a control freak, was linked to my anxiety. So the anxiety would feed the control and the control would feed the anxiety. So if I wasn't able to control situations, my anxiety would go sky high. And if I was controlling the situations, my anxiety was still going sky high. So I, you know, I was realizing they were feeding one another um, and that I, you know, I just love to control the situation. I'm still recovering from that because I'm a get, I'm let's get shit done kind of girl. You know, mm -hmm. I see the problem. Let's get into the solutions. Let's go. Um, I'm learning to be able to breathe through processes like that because I can plow people over when I'm in that mode. Exactly. How did the nine months change that for you? 
what was one thing that was beneficial from the nine months helping you realize that I can't control things? Everything is not my problem and I don't need to worry about it. And it's okay if I don't get to this. It's okay if someone doesn't get back to me. And and this is, and I wanted to give you an example of there's, I guess, healthy control and unhealthy control. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like um, you send someone a project. Let's say someone that reported to Kim had an assignment that was due and didn't do the assignment. So in my mind, I think, okay, a healthy control freak is going to be like, okay, I'm sending this to this person. This is the deadline of when this is due. Now I need to have plan B available in case it doesn't backfire. So am I going, like, let's say the due date is Thursday. I'm going to find out on Tuesday what this person is doing. And then we need to think of a plan. I feel like in my mind, is that considered healthy? Because what's unhealthy and healthy? And how did the program that you participated in help you change? First of all, that's a great question. I'm thinking back on that program, how it helped me change. I, I think I'm not quite sure if the program helped me start surrendering the control. Um, that program was helping me step up and cleaning up lies from when I was living in corporate America. I had very Mm -hmm. successful corporate um, America positions, but Mm -hmm. I was living on, walking and living on lies. So the program helped me, um, it really, it just really helped me, especially after that day of falling asleep at that red light, coming in and standing around my house going, you you know, you've been living a box of lies, you know, and that's probably part of the, you know, the fatigue going into the depression. So I'm thinking back on when I was in that nine month journey, if um, how that helped me, I'm not quite sure how that helped me. If it was starting me, starting me on the journey of learning how to surrender, but to the other part of your comment and your question is, you know, sure. If you have, uh, if you're in an organization and you're working on a project with someone and you do all your part and give it, pass it on to the next team lead, you know, the team person and you know, due date's Thursday and you're on Tuesday going, you know, tapping your fingers. What are they doing? Where are they? That is a very, that's, those are boundaries. That's, that's unspoken boundaries. So here, I'll use myself as an example. Here's what I do when I'm on a call with a potential client, having a clarity discovery call, whatever you want to call it. At the end of that call, after we go through an hour of spending time, I always swing back around. I reiterate everything that person has said. Mm -hmm. I reiterate everything that the whole coaching program, the logistics of real quickly what it looks like. And then I tell them my next steps Mm -hmm. within 24 hours. You will get a follow-up email from me Mm -hmm. reiterating everything. And then from there, I'm going to want to know when you would like to move forward. So I always ask first, that doesn't have to be etched in concrete timelines. What's going on? And they may say, I need a week to, to digress all of this. Okay, great. Just know that in a week, I will be following back up with an email to see where you are at so I can get the they get the agreement in hands and the first payment in hands for them to move forward. So I set the timelines. I always, always do that. You know, I like to ask people, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm not setting the timelines, okay, Shirley, um, all right, w- you know, we're going to co-host um, a master class on May 1st. Okay, let's have this call. All right, I'll do this. You'll do this. How much time do we all need to come back together before we can get on a call and start mapping out an outline for that? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, sh- well, you know, Shirley might say, well, gosh, you know, I've got some kids soccer games this week and it's a little busy. Can you give me through the weekend and can we wrap back around on Monday? Sure, absolutely. Let's set a time. Let's do it. So it's and taking then just let control. It go. Yeah. Taking control of the situation. That way you're not sitting there thinking because when you are doing the discovery or the clarity call, it's always maintaining a healthy control of the conversation and not giving that person the option of, oh, well, when do you want to meet back up? It should be, we, you know, I, I get what you're saying because 
you're asking the question in a way where you're still in control and it's a close ended response that it, that is being given to you, not an open ended response that's going to go nowhere. Yes. And, and you know something, when you do ask a question like that, a close ended response, I always like to see what a potential client comes back. OK, you've got your aches, your pains, <laughs> your challenges, your struggles, been there, done it. And then they say, well, I need a month to digress this. And it's like, really? OK, you've been here for this long and you need another month to stay in the muckety, yuckety, muckety of the yuck. Seriously. Let's bring it back than a month. You don't have to sign the next time we talk, but you, I will not give people another month because my heart compassionately, why stay in this pain? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're showing up and up be handed. You're in an undesirable um, spot in your life. Why stay there? And I've been there. And Mm -hmm. let me tell you, I'm a type of person. I don't want to be here anymore. I'm not quite sure what next steps I need to take, Mm -hmm. but I don't like being in that type of muck. I really don't. Mm Mm-hmm. I like that. I definitely like that. That's all part of taking charge, being bold, being firm. So I wanted to ask you, (laughs) your marriage now, is that your second marriage? It is second marriage. So when were you divorcing? Was it around the time you fell asleep at that red light or was it it had already Mm -hmm. happened? No, No. it it had all that was years ago. um, The first divorce came through and Yes, it had already happened. The first divorce had come through. Um, we were already married, um, living in this property. We have all, we had already gone through a major renovation in this property mm-hmm. um, is when I had fallen asleep. Do you feel as though what was going on in your personal life was affecting all that as well? That oh, stress was just know, eating you up? Yeah, heck yeah. I mean, I would... You know, I mean, that day when I was coming home, fell asleep, I was coming from a fitness client's home, a very Mm -hmm. predominant man, a retired judge, very predominant in this area. Last name is very well known politically. Mm -hmm. And I was with him for 13 years. And then um, a few months, unbeknownst to all of us going into quarantine, a few months, um, he had stopped the training. I mean, I was still training him when he was 90 years old. Yes, going to his, yes, going to his home. And, um, we had pulled, he had pulled back the train because his body was breaking down. His mind was still very alert and it was getting to be too much. And of course it was very gentle training. And, Mm -hmm. um, and then we went into quarantine and there was no way his house manager was even going to even let me go to the front door just to swing by and say hi. There's no, and I totally respect that. And then unfortunately he passed. Mm -hmm. So my last time seeing him was what, and that, when I, when he pulled back on the training, even though he's still alive, I went through a form of grief because I had been going there. It was a routine for 13 years, yeah. you know, um, it was a form of grief. And, and then when he did pass, it was even another form of grief. And after he passed, my dad passed a couple months later. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of that going on, but I would be coming, I would drive home from his home, from his house. So ungrateful and just grumpy because I had trained him for what he was paying me for and you know i wasn't seeing the sunny day and it was a sunny day i was seeing drudgery and clouds mm-hmm. and i knew that day i had to start cleaning my shit i'd start cleaning my i had to get my act together and one part of the act i i chose to get together was the lies that i was living to walk a road in corporate mm-hmm. and to be very successful in corporate i mean i come from a a era of you can go into a corporate job, lay down a um, resume, and they never checked it. You were this an is a era. Lot, this, Kim. Yes. Women this is a didn't long time speak. Ago. They didn't say much. Just the fact that you had jobs that were important in the corporate world during that time is interesting mm-hmm. because during that time, a lot of women were considered secretaries, right? Yeah. No, it was. Yeah. Right. Yes. Receptionists, secretaries. And I was in management and I, I see, I, I could see. So I was working up. I, it was, 
money and titles were so important to me back then. And mm -hmm. that was part of that falling asleep at the road at the red light. So I came in and I got really clean with myself. And I looked at my husband and I said, one of the lies I've been living is I'm completely 100% college educated. It was not true. It was not true. And I said, the other thing is, well, <laughs> I never finished high school. So guess what? I'm going to go back and I'm going to finish this unfinished stuff up. So in my car, I went, drove to the building and I walked in and I said, I don't care where. I don't care how much I'm going to finish this up and I don't care how I got to do it. And she goes, well, first of all, it's not going to cost you anything. <laughs> Kim, hold up. Yeah. I'm, let's, <laughs> let's take it back. Now you came home and told the first husband or the second husband. This is the second husband. You told the second. So did the first husband ever find out that you didn't finish high school or college? Uh, I don't think so. No. Oh, shit. You no, know, because I was in the midst of my corporate career. I didn't dare let that lie. Shit. So how did you, I guess things were different then. How did you not finish high school and work up to management? Well, yeah, how the, the fuck the did you The resume get... said something. Oh, different. shit. Yeah. That's why, Kim, you're like, all oh, the lies. This is why it was coming down on me. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 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 Oh, my. So I said, no more, Kim. You're going to clean this up. You and, and I did. I cleaned it up. I had to take a couple tests mm -hmm. and she called me back that afternoon and said good news bad news good news is you only need one credit bad news is it's gonna be two credits it's world history you gotta take and mm -hmm. I, I surely I started sweating when I heard this woman say world history I'm like are you kidding me I can't remember dates went to school at nighttime drove from September to January from seven o'clock at night to 9 15 I don't I'm not awake at seven o'clock at night drove, never missed a class, got an A, did extra credit. He was a phenomenal teacher. It was a phenomenal experience. I came clean. And at the age of 50, I put on cap and I put on gown and I walked across the stage and I received my high school diploma. And I was not going to go to that graduation. I was my I said, I'm not going to go. He goes, I, if I have to drag you there, you're going to go. You've earned this. And I'm like, uh, you know, plain small. Ugh, all right, I'll go. So I went to the rehearsal and I came home. I'm like, I'm glad I went and I'm going to go tomorrow night. I had friends show up. They brought me graduation cards and presents. We all went out to dinner. I cleaned that up. And then I went to um, the community college that I had attended and sat down with the counselor and said, I never completed my um, associates in, uh, in liberal arts with a study of um, mental health. And he said, all right, let me pull this stuff up. Go sit down. I'll come back out. And he came back out and he goes, you're not going to believe this. He goes, you need one credit. And I'm like, what is with this one credit thing? You're I mean, almost man, done. Quit. But then you escape. Yeah. You like get to a point where you're like, I would do. forget this. I'm walking away. That's what I would do. Yeah. Because I come from a family of work, 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 overtime, work. You make money. Don't live above and beyond your means. There wasn't talk about strong education. Mm -hmm. It was work, 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 work. So I would get antsy during education because I need to work. I need to work. I need to work. So I said, well, what's the class? And he says, it's a fit ed, phys ed credit. And I busted out loud and said, I could write the whole program. I have a fitness business. And he goes, government won't let you do it. You can't do it. You're going to go sit in class. And I said, put me in a yoga class. I'll take a yoga class. And I finished the associate's degree up at the same time I was finishing up. It was a two-year coaching program I finished up in nine months as well. Very interesting. So now that's going to go into the next question I have. You graduated with your yeah. high school degree at 50 because for the first, mm -hmm. what, 18, technically you're supposed to graduate. My math is rusty, 18, 28, 38, 48 for 30 to no they're 48 for what is it 42 years you lived a freaking lie lady so that goes mm -hmm. in to tell me the top three things before the top three pieces of advice you have based off of what you just told me in your experience what do you have to say to somebody who's 40 who is living a lie presently at this moment it may not even be a goddamn lie. It may just be they didn't finish high school. 
They didn't finish college. Even me, myself, I have credits I need to finish, but I don't, there's a part of me that doesn't want to finish my credits because Mm -hmm. it doesn't apply to my life. So I guess it just depends on what's going on in the world right now. But anyone that has unfinished business out there, I'm going to say it that way. What message do you have to these women with unfinished business? Because you were 50 when you graduated with your high school Mm -hmm. diploma. Officially. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm a believer that unfinished business eats us up alive. And it was eating me up alive. I mean, you're talking a girl that was teaching spinning classes in the best shape yes. she could possibly be in. And I'm falling asleep at wheels and I can barely climb stairs. So there was a lot of shame involved there. A lot of shame. And at one time, even what I just said to you, I started getting more comfortable saying them in rooms and I've surely I've said in rooms when I've said that and women have stood up and applauded me and I'm like, you don't, please, you don't need to stand up and applaud me, but okay, I'll take it. Um, it's, there was shame. There was what I would think of what you were thinking of me of being a loser and, uh, and dumb and uneducated. And I was very, very successful and corporate and very successful as an entrepreneur too. And trust me, I've had my ups and downs, but to let that go and work through that shame and, and to be so proud of yourself because listen, an education is just an education. A degree is just a piece of paper. It's like the, the education system, they grade us upon A, B, C, D, E, F. Are you kidding me? We're grown up on a, a, an alpha, a letter of an alphabet. I mean, seriously, whatever happened to about learning and growing here, and you know, is learning how to let a lot of that stigma go and to be proud of who you are in that moment. Not finishing. I mean, I went all the way through uh, halfway through my senior year. I was supposed to graduate early and I got very sick and decided spring break after being sick, spring break was far more important. I'm just not coming back from spring break because back then it was party time in 1978, you know, so is, you know, they're not mistakes. I look at them. I used to look at them as mistakes. They're opportunities for me to evolve and grow and share my story with somebody else. Like you said, who be, who could be sitting there living with a lie or an unfinished business. It's finish the business, but also, as I say, finish the business, listen to what Shirley just said. I've got some credits I got to finish. I'm not quite sure I want to finish it. Just be clear that you are finishing the business on your terms, Mm -hmm. not society, not someone else's. If you've got, I don't know, a few classes of an undergraduate degree and right now you're raising kids and it just doesn't roll for you, then don't roll it, don't Mm -hmm. roll it. But be proud of the fact where you are with that. Mm -hmm. I like how you said the education is a piece of paper and you know, I totally understand what you're trying to say for any listeners out there that feels as though we're disrespecting their education. We're not. Okay. Take proud of what you have done. If you have your associates, your bachelors, you've gone to get your master's, you have your PhD, take pride in that. And, and that's great success. But when I sit here and think of, you know, how the grading system works, A's, B's, C's, D's, E's, and F. You stop at F. There's nothing beyond F. Who the fuck made that decision? I don't know. Okay. That's fine. (laughs) All right. But then when I think of someone who works with their hands, you take a contractor who may have not Mm. did well in school, but can build a home out of this world. May not be able to perform heart surgery, but can build a world out of this world beautiful home perfect but yet could have been a c or d dude in school but he's using different parts of his brain that maybe the medical professional is not he should he or she should still be respected the same but you know that's not the world we live in Because the medical physician, 
the person with the PhD is going to get a lot more respect than that general contractor. And this is the world we live in. It's fucking sad. It's awful to say. Yeah, it is. You know, certain degrees, certain jobs gives you more respect than others. And that's not a good way to be. Everybody deserves respect, no matter what you do. I remember when I was working at a hospital, I used to be the unit secretary at a hospital. There was a physician. She was a woman with attitude. Um, when we first started, people, I remember saying, she's a bitch. As I got to know her, she wasn't a bitch. She was very assertive. She spoke to you very directly. Mm-hmm. I am not here to make your day. I really don't care if you like me or not. This is what I need. And I would like it done. I mean, she was direct as can be. And I remember she told me one time, it doesn't matter what job you do in this facility. You could be mopping floors. You mop that floor to the best of your ability. This is what the MD told me, you know, and we shouldn't degrade someone for the job that they have because everyone's job matters. And do it to the best of your ability. And if you don't like it, there are several other things out there you can do. Don't sit. Don't complain. Don't mope. Don't put a message on social media. Get up. Find something else to do. That feeds your soul. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. But we, unfortunately, are in a society where people don't want to work or they hate their jobs and service is terrible. I mean... Look, I look at it this way. You know, people look down upon um, the um, trash, the people that pick up trash. Are you kidding me? You're taking my trash away from me. You're keeping my neighborhood clean. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, The person that mops the floor in the hospital. Dang, you're making a good germ-free floor for me to walk on if I got to come through the hospital. But we don't look at it that way at all, you know. And we don't know the story behind every single individual. I mean, a person that is mopping that floor, man or woman, doing janitorial service, that could be a moonlighting job for them because they could be a single parent and they want to pay cash for an education for their children or something. We don't know the story, but we're so quick to judge like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I lived like that. I was afraid to tell because I thought I would be burned at the stake and judged so badly because I wasn't cool and smart enough, but yet I was smart enough to climb corporate ladders and be very successful. Mm -hmm. You know, I just didn't have parents say, no, you need an education. I had parents that go, no, you need to work, Mm -hmm. you know, and that, you know, which is a lot of the things that we were talking about earlier, that white space. That's why I battle sometimes with that white space. White space, I should be working, you know. Mm-hmm. No, no. It's unraveling the wiring that we have had when we were younger. And it's unraveling the wire, wiring that society says. We have to show up a certain way. That's bullshit. We do not. That's BS. We need to show up as us, our being. And as long as we're healthy and safe and happy, let's go. Exactly. Let's go. So the final two is, what are two pieces of advice based on the woman you are today with, we're taking all, everything you've learned and relearned and applied into your life and into your business. What is two pieces of advice that you have to offer to women? Well, first of all, I, I listened to that question, Shirley, and I think, man, Kim, you need a vacation. You've come <laughs> through a lot. Woo. I'm looking forward to more, but let me take a vacation first. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just an advocate. I'm a huge, huge supporter of women really claiming their voices. And I don't, and I mean women of all, of all ethnicity, all shape, size, all all whatever religious belief, whatever that is you bring to the table, I'm just a proponent of speaking up. Mm -hmm. And if we are not speaking up, we as a gender are still going to struggle with lack of equity. So my big thing is ladies, whether you're in a board meeting or just a meeting in an organization and you're at that, so to speak, table, 
speak up and let go of that. I call it the inner critic. I call it the hag in the attic. Let go of that hag in the attic of saying, you better not speak up. They may think you're dumb. Because I did that for many, many years. And I would end up in those bathrooms with tears going down my face and go home with sleepless nights. We have a voice and we have something to be said and heard. And we're all waiting to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is my big piece is, you know, just speak it up. It goes back like to that doctor that, you know, that you were working for, you know, people, she was assertive. She wasn't aggressive. She was assertive and mm -hmm. straightforward. That doesn't mean she's a bitch. Mm -hmm. Not at all. But go let those people over there call her that bitch. She's getting it done and she's grounded and she knows herself. Mm -hmm. And that's my biggest piece of advice. It's just know yourself. Take the time to get to know yourself. And what is your second? Uh, say the second question again, oh, <laughs> please. I said, what is the two pieces of advice you have to oh, offer two. to women? Mm hmm you can think um, about this the one. The other advice, no, the other one is like, have some damn fun. I mean, <laughs> come on, let's have some fun. Have I'll some white space. You, what, you know, just have some white space and have some fun. Just have some fun and find the women that you can get out there and have some fun with. Be alone, have some fun. But, you know, it's that joyous, the, 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 those fun moments where you can lose track of time. Mm -hmm. And you're in a position to lose track of time. Just have some fun. Absolutely. I love the two pieces of advice because they're simple. Number one, know yourself. Number two, have fun. We're talking mm -hmm. to Kim today who for years lived a lie. Kim received her high school diploma at 50. She was one credit short. And for years, she just kept pushing it under the rug, pushing it under the rug, pushing it under the rug until one day she finally woke up and say, I'm going to do what I need to do. And she did it. And then when she was done that, she went and did what she needed to do to complete her associates. You know, a lot of us may have unfinished business out there, but one big point that Kim made was make sure it's what you want, not what your mom is telling you, not what your dad's telling you, not what auntie's telling you, or your really good friends saying, just do it, do it. Make sure it is what you want to do. Even I myself, I have unfinished credits, but every day I have to ask myself when I kind of scan my life and say, you know what, Shirley, is doing this going to be a benefit? What's the real reason why you want to finish getting these credits? Is it because you're comparing yourself to your friend on social media who just graduated with their bachelor's and that just seems good to you and you feel as though you need to be doing it too? Really analyze your reasoning of your why. As Kim said, make sure it is what you want. Know yourself and have fun. As always, I want to appreciate and thank you for listening to the podcast. Kim, I want to thank you for being a guest and sharing your story with us. And my listeners, remember to love yourself, voice yourself, and be yourself. To the next episode, guys. Have a great one. Thanks for tuning in to Fun Pale Podcast. If you want to continue the conversation or share your takeaways, I want to hear from you. Head on over to the website or join our Facebook community and comment your favorite part of the show or share your thoughts. I want to hear what you have to say. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Chat with you next week.